personality in the area of Islamic economics, Islamic finance. All right. Now, maybe just I just want to, to say that in the last few years, maybe what, 10 years or so, um, Professor Tarikullah has, has tried to put forward a slightly different approach in developing Islamic economics. And his very, very big concern on areas of ecology, uh, the environment, uh, and in particular, he has written a lot in the area of circular economy. Right? And I'm sure you will see it in the slides after this, uh, what is exactly meant. And uh, one of the things that he has been trying to popularize is rather than we call our area economics with a M-I-C-S, he has been trying to promote economics with a Y. So it's M-Y-C-S. And I remember when I first saw it, I asked him what it was. He was saying, well, this is economics and ecology. Yeah, uh, because you cannot talk about economics, you cannot talk about Islamic economics without being concerned about that bigger area, which is uh, the environment, uh, how we treat the planet, and so on. I think this is a very interesting uh, approach that he has taken, and um, I think we're going to be in for a very interesting uh, session. Uh, you have a very long slide. I, I, I'm sure you're not going to be able to cover all of them, but uh, well, that just gives us reason to call him back again in the future to give a part two of this if we can't do. We will spend maybe about, you give Prof. Tarikula about 45 to 50 minutes to make his presentation, and then hopefully we can open up for about half an hour or a little bit more for Q&A, right? So let's try to keep to that timetable. So with that, I invite now Prof. Tarikula. You are free to stand or sit or whatever makes you feel comfortable. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Dear, dear colleagues, dear students, dear faculty, and those who is outside in the Zoom uh, listening to us. And, and thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that uh, long introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't deserve that, but still, you should be. Uh, I am a long term visitor of IIUM. I, this is what we were talking to Professor Aslam when we were coming through the corridor. And that was uh, the, the beginning of this building, actually. So, uh, so IIUM is, of course, uh, very dear to me. And we we used to come here to do a lot of activities, definitely, when I was in, in IRTI. And uh, one of the things which uh, Professor Aslam mentioned is the conferences. You know, we used to organize a lot of conferences, and the money is, of course, the most important thing. So once, when we put up the call, not once, it actually happened more than once, for the call for papers, 50% was from the IIUM. <laughs> so that, that was a big difficulty to, to be, you know, uh, selective and inclusive of all. But so that's, that's a good thing, which uh, the, the impact of the IIUM is very much obvious from, from that particular thing, which, which I know very well. So all of us, if we have studied economics, we know that economics is the study of human behavior. And I want to discuss with you how the human behavior has destroyed everything and what we can do to repair it and to overcome the destruction and to leave something better behind us, which is the basic message of Islamic economics and finance to start with. So this, the, I'm using the word anthropogenic here because uh, I'm urging you to remember the word anthropogenic because this is what it means. 
human behavior destroying everything is is uh, encapsulated in the word anthropogenic. So uh, I, I will give you the conclusion of my presentation. And after that, in three minutes, four minutes, if somebody wants to go, you are free to go. <laughs> but, but the conclusion is that, you know, when we teach you in the classrooms and you learn it from, and go to the market, we, we talk about economics and finance. We don't talk about society. We don't talk about environment and the ecological environment. We don't talk about spirituality and the connection with nature. So that's why my, my discussion is uh, we cannot have a good economy without a society which is having well-being. And we cannot have a society with welfare or a society without good air quality, good water quality, with ecology. And you cannot have good air quality, good ecology without having a spiritual connection with the natural world. So that's in economics, this type of picture doesn't exist. That's why we have the human behavior damaging everything. Damaging the environment means damaging everything. Damaging the society means damaging everything. But that leads us to the to the question that uh, if if why we have a, a, a damaging situation all around us because we don't have this picture. So the picture by itself is overcoming that damage because everything is interdependent. So. So that's the first con conclusion of my discussion with you today. The second and more important conclusion is that everybody talks about sustainable development, but nobody will give you a picture specific what does sustainable development mean, okay? So I put here, I, I map here two very important variables. One of you, you already know, the human development index. HDI, uh, how much we have overcome poverty, how much education, how much employment opportunities. This is very famous. Uh, uh, there is a lot of statistics and a lot of study about it. Which is human development representation of development in a composite way. On the other hand, which we don't talk about is the ecological footprint of this human development. So I map it here for you. There is ecological footprint and there is human development. Uh, so we know there is only one world. This is one world. We don't have more than one world. The developing countries, the developed countries, the developed countries are putting them together, are operating at more than five Earths. But what that means is that if all the people, the 8 billion people in the world will live like the, an individual in the developed countries is living, we need six hours. One hour is not enough. So to make it sustainable, we have to shrink it into the one hour. So, so what does that mean? Is that within the one hour capacity, we have to have the human development. And probably that's what the, uh, the Madani concept would look like. If you study it in more detail, this is what the Madani concept will look like. In the capacity of one earth, we have to have high human development index. So that's the, that's the target of the, uh, of the uh, so uh, if that's my lecture. So if somebody wants to go, you can go. <laughs> Okay, so let me explain what I, I am saying. So the anthropogenic, it, it means that negative and degenerative implications, which are the externalities of human activities and actions on the biological regenerative capacity of Earth and the biosphere. This, this is what anthropogenic is defined by the United Nations Agency. So if we look into the into the, our source of wisdom, the Quran, you know, this verse from Quran Rome, 
is exactly defining anthropogenic in that sense. The ma kasabat idea nas, the destruction is being done by the hand of the people. So this is what anthropogenic actually means. Okay. So what is the destruction? What, what is the destruction? What's the facade? And here's the picture of the facade. This is the, the world's regenerative capacity, annual regenerative capacity of the world. The green is the annual regenerative capacity of the world. And the red means it is being depleted at a very fast rate. And what is alarming is it started only recently. You can see it is uh, uh, 1971, it is appearing and then it's going on very fast. For the year 2023, this is for the GCC country. Okay. And this is for Malaysia. Malaysia looks to you very green and everything is beautiful, fantastic. But the, the region, degeneration of the Earth's uh, regenerative capacity is like, like that. So, what is the consequence of this? this uh, the consequence of this is that. Uh, the, the industrial, our industrial living after the industrial age, the temperatures are increasing. And by year 2100, the temperatures will rise to 3.9 C, based, uh, taking the basis uh, as the uh, pre industrial age. So, what does that mean? Here, this picture is very serious. So, in the Makassid, we talk about future generations, the continuity of human being. So this is the intergenerational transmission of the negative externalities which I come. So what is happening here is that the, the, the color, of course, it, it shows how, how much is the temperature increasing. Okay, so if you look at the picture, you can get the presentation because maybe you are not look, able to look at it and see it there. This thing is happening uh, by our generation. 1940, it has started increasing the temperature. And then our children and our grandchildren are going to suffer. So we are, you and me, and we are the only generation who is responsible for this not our fathers, not our grandfathers, not our great scholars. So to expect that our great scholars should have addressed this issue, it doesn't make scientific sense. So we are responsible. So we have to understand it. Okay. So what it means is that my grandson who was born last year, when he becomes 70, he will face four degree temperature. Right now the temperature is 1.1 degree. And you can you can already see the difficulty which is, which is causing for the world. So for the future generations, it's going to be disaster if the temperatures are allowed to move on as they are. So we have to do something. So, so people, science-based science -based, uh, uh, policies, they, they really recognize what's the challenge. Here's a picture which I summarized from the uh, World Economic Forum's Global Risk Reports for the years 19 something, uh, seven, 2007 up till 2020, 2022. The green means that the risks are driven by environmental and ecological concerns. You can see it is green, everything is becoming green. The, the, the blue means economic risks. So it doesn't mean that the economic risks have disappeared. They have aggravated, but the concern about the climate risk is so much that it, it is becoming the most important because my country had a, a, a tsunami this year. Uh, that means that everything was spread away. So we cannot have development without long term uh, addressing the issue of the externalities. Let me use the word for that. 
So, so what, what, what went wrong with economics? Uh, most of you, if you have studied economics, this is what economics is. This is called Simelson's circular flow diagram. There is, the markets are captured in the affected market, households, product markets, and uh, here businesses. So the money is flowing uh, between, and this is the uh, shareholders capitalism, the world is, is like that. We have to maximize the man-made capital within this framework. The problem is that you can see here, there's nothing about society and nothing about the environment. So they, they knew, they discussed it, they said that it's not our business to talk about society. This is socialism. It's not our business to talk about the ecological environment. This is ecology. So we, we don't talk about, but we will have some externalities. We will have some negative externalities but there's the consequence of growing the economy. We don't have any solution and let the temperatures rise to 3.9 degrees. See, there's the attitude, okay? There's the attitude. So that's the reason why it is going to that direction. And if you look at the recognitions, that is the understanding which is being, is, is always being recognized in economics. 2018, Nobel Prize was given to this gentleman there. His name is Nerdos. He's the co-author of Smilson's famous book. And why they gave him that Nobel Prize? Because he predicted that the temperatures will rise to 3.5 and beyond 3.5, 4C, and we cannot do anything. We have to adapt to it, okay? So that type of mentality is, of course, the, the core in the, So as a result of that approach of economics, we have, all the things which we know, the, the waste and the climate issues, the social problems multiplying and going on. This is the data which I, I showed you in the beginning, that the development, the developed countries have a huge ecological footprint. There are some countries 7.5 and even some countries 15 earth capacity are working. Most of the least developed countries are within the one hour capacity. So that's the important thing to take away from here. So what we can do is to stop the degeneration which is going on, restore and regenerate. That's the, that's the, whole, that's the whole idea. So what Islamic economics and finance can do to address that problem? This, my remaining discussion will be on this particular thing. One of the most important approach which we have the framework is the Makassid. Most of you understand about the Makassid. Uh, the Makassid approach, recently our INSEEP has translated the book of Sheikh Yusuf Khadravi about the conservation of environment. So according to him, the Makassid is to be integrated, uh, sorry, the, the environment is to be integrated in each of the Makassid. If, if, if you pick up the first Makassid, which is religion, for example, we need purity, correct or not? We need water to purify ourselves. We, we need a pure place. We need, so, uh, we need air to breathe, and so we live and we pray. Otherwise, we cannot do it. So in the same way, it goes into each and every maqsab. We cannot talk about wealth creation and wealth preservation without uh, taking care of the environment. So according to him, the environment should be an integral part of each of the five, five the maqasid. There are other approaches which I don't want to touch here. So uh, we know in the, in the maqasid, there's the concept of the maslaha, and there is the concept of the mafsada. The masaleh are the positive externalities, masaleh ama, the, we would say the positive externalities, and mafasit ama will be the negative externalities. So if we put a little bit uh, in, into balancing equation, uh, of course, whatever we do, there are positive externalities, we benefit others also, but at the, 
sometimes there are negative externalities. And if the negative externalities exceed the positive externalities, this is the degenerative which I showed to you. And if the positive externalities and the negative externalities are matching each other out, this is the sustainable, the sustainable development idea comes from that particular thing. And when the positive externalities exceed the negative externalities, this is regenerative. We are having a system which I mentioned to you, uh, within the one earth capacity, we, there is no limit on human development, but within the one earth capacity. So that's the idea here. So what is the, what is the whole idea? Maximize and preserve uh, positive externalities, ma the matter, and minimize and prevent the negative externalities. This is the, the maxat will be like that. So if if I summarize everything together, and I I ask the question, what is the promise of Islamic economics and finance? So the first picture, the first picture in there, is the business as usual, which will lead to temperatures which is more than 4C. And the second picture is the uh, ESG, which is very popular nowadays. But you can see here, most of the data show that ESG companies are leading towards 3C, actually. Because uh, the ESG is driven by the notion that if you do environmentally good, you generate more profit. They're still driven by the profit motive, but not the environmental uh, motive. And then there is the SDG, this is the Paris Agreement. They're saying that uh, we should keep the temperatures below 2C. And then what I am saying is that, can we, uh, using the Makassid and the other Islamic economics principles, keep the temperatures below 1.5C? So uh, this is what I'm uh, going to discuss with you. I, I, I summarized this, this whole idea which I discussed so far in this in this picture. So in the picture, we have positive externalities and then we have negative externalities, which positive externalities, as I said, are masale ama and negative externalities are mafasit al ama. And then we have regenerative activities and we have degenerative activities. So it, it, may, it gives us four quadrants, actually. The green quadrant is the ideal quadrant. What are the activities? I have a long list of activities which we can put the kit into these four quadrants. So just for the sake of an example, what are the uh, activities which fit into the green quadrant, the regenerative? The COVID-19 vaccine is one of the examples, for example. So research and development, leading to green technology and other things will fit into it. So what are the, the one which go into the negative and degenerative? For example, CO2 emissions, waste, water, and air pollution, deforestation, and, and biodiversity very clearly. But then there are other activities which go to the uh, uh, quadrant two and quadrant four. It's our role, it's our role to rethink these relationships and to move our economies into the quadrant one. Meaning by that, to reduce the negative externalities by different ways and means, and to increase the positive externalities so that the system will be regenerative. We are here. So uh, that leads us to how to internalize the externality. That question becomes. The first and foremost thing is human behavior, behavioral norms. And you know, in Islamic economics and finance, we have those beautiful behavioral norms. Some of them I listed here. Trustee of Allah and earth and responsibilities go beyond profits. The human being is Khalifa Allah fil earth. We have to establish Mizan, the universal balance. And we have to minimize, eliminate waste, which is Israf and Tabzi. And we have to protect the uh, rights of passive stakeholders, which is uh, generations and other. And our prophet's title is Rahatul Alameen, is mercy for the world. 
not only for human beings, uh, not only for Muslims, but much more inclusive and much more plural. Advice promotes masala and prevents poverty. Is Alamin and Sani follows the middle part, the wasatia. So these are some of the behavioral norms which we have been emphasizing in the theory of Islamic economics and even in Islamic finance to make it more responsible. But the practice has to come to this theoretical premises. The, the concept of Mizan, you know, uh, and then I was learning this in the KG, for example, Mizan was the balance to me, and my teacher emphasized to me, which is still very relevant, but the Mizan here in this context is much more wider than the Mizan in the balance. The balance is very relevant. It's about the universal cosmic balance also. The earth in, in the, so it's a different type of understanding which we have to refer. So what I, I give you some examples are what are the different level of understanding of the Mizan, okay, which is very important. Nature-based solutions means we have to learn from nature. Uh, what, how, how nature, how nature behaves. You see here, this is, it looks very simple because we did it in the KG. The trees actually release oxygen, which we breathe in and we breathe out carbon and the trees consume that carbon and transform it into oxygen. What happens is that there's a circulation here. This is the natural law. This is one of the most important natural law. So we should not disturb it. We should learn from it. If you learn from it, it doesn't waste. There is no waste in this process. The carbon goes up and it becomes oxygen and that oxygen goes up and becomes carbon. So there's a zero waste philosophy behind it. So we have to learn from, from it. The second example is the nature law of the natural law is the water cycle. The same thing, we did it in the KG, but we don't uh, base our policies. Nowadays, there's a nature-based solution type of thing which is coming up. The same thing, the water uh, is in the circuit, goes up, comes down, goes up and down. Not a single drop of water has been wasted by nature. But we have polluted it, of course, definitely. So that is the connection with nature. That we have to have that type of understanding with the nature, which will lead us to, in, in the shareholders capitalism, that is the maximization of man-made capital, which leads to externalities. But we have to have at least four forms of capital, natural capital, social capital, and spiritual capital. So the framework will not allow any externalities because it will become in the interdependent framework. So, so, so what, is, uh, what, is the, what is another step forward from here is how to internalize the externalities. We have to change the criteria of doing the business. Uh, I simplify it because they say ESG criteria and there's a lot of into it, but if you simplify it, it, it becomes zero waste. We eliminate waste from the production and consumption process, and we eliminate emissions from the industrial production process. And of course, we have the zero river. And there's another important thing here, forbearance, alas, which we talk about a lot, but we haven't been able to institutionalize it. So that's what I call uh, integrated well out. Actually, I'm talking about uh, a combination of so many of my papers here. So, but the concepts are. So, so in practice, is it possible to have a zero waste or zero emissions type of uh, economy which will uh, eliminate the negative externalities? Uh, uh, what is happening is that uh, whatever I have mentioned is actually happening. The behavioral change is already taking place. There are a lot of studies. One of the studies I put here in the yellow, which shows that uh, people are becoming much more aware of the decision with respect to their consumption and production uh, based on uh, what 
improves their health conditions, but improves the environment and that. So there's a lot of uh, things going on on eliminating waste from the process. The design of products uh, are uh, being changed, a lot of regulation going on. There's this concept of after sales service to and repair and so the circular economy concepts. I don't want to go into the detail of this because the time will not allow me to uh, come to some of the very important points here. So this one here is important. If we have to move from the uh, degenerative system which we have now, we have to have two types of strategies. One strategy is to adopt different type of uh, criteria, which I said the zero waste criteria, zero emission, which is insetting criteria. We want to change our, our whole system, uh, business process, and where we can ad adopt new, new uh, technologies, new ideas, new criteria, so which is called insetting. And if we do that, and still there is some negative externalities, we have to do something like charity, uh, like uh, planting trees or whatever, which is offsetting. So at each stage, whether it's the corporate body or the consumer or the household, has to adopt the insetting and offsetting strategies. Uh, when I was preparing the lecture, you know, I. I, I came to a very interesting conclusion, which is in this particular. I talk about greening deposits. In, in, uh, in the finance, there is a core concept, which is the concept of discounting, which is the rate of interest, for example. Discounting means that the future the, the present is more important than the future. The more uh, the rate of interest is, the more we are giving importance to the present over the future. So if discounting is zero, that means we are treating the present the same way as the future. Correct? So low discounting will make the future more equally important uh, with the present and high discounting will make the, the present more important as compared to the future, which is the interest connection in the deterioration of the ecological, the degradation, which I said, there's the, there's the discounting connection. But if we look at the deposits of banks, most of the deposits are either zero current account, zero discount, implied discount rate is zero, are they are very low rate of return. Still, the implied uh, discount rate is very low. It's a very future supportive money is coming in, but the problem arises when it is transformed into financing and given to the users of funds at a higher discount rate. So this is a mismatch. You know, we have, to, we have been talking about mismatches in the balance sheet, but this type of mismatch we never talk about. So one of the important, I think, it's a good research area for the Islamic finance people to undertake PhD or master's studies on this mismatch in the uh, disc implied discount rates, which is having an implication uh, whether we prefer the present or the future, or we prefer the future over the present. And the second thing which we which we don't discuss in Islamic finance. I don't know how many of you like Mudaraba and Musharaka over Tawaru. Many of you, correct? So my departure from this whole discussion of Tawaru versus Mudaraba was five, six years ago because it was not productive. So now I am presenting to you another question. Okay? There is a Musharaka Mudaraba, which is financing fossil fuel cars, and there is a Murabaha, which is financing green cars, which one is better? This question is never asked, correct? But the question is very relevant for Islamic finance. Another question, my friends, most of them will support the MPO, Murabaha, over Tawaru. I, I put you this question. There is 
uh, there is NPO Murabaha, which doesn't care about environment and doesn't care about emissions and waste. But there is a Tawaruk which says that we do finance businesses which follow zero waste and zero emissions. Which one is better? The questions are not raised. Uh, what I'm telling you is that these are the researchable questions which you must add. So, uh, so I, we wrote a paper recently, uh, design of Islamic financial contracts and for, for each contract has to follow a sustainability path to, to overcome the externality, negative externalities. Each financial contract has to follow a sustainability path. Here I am quite some of that. So, uh, Sharia basis, service to society. It's very interesting also I found service to society. You see this picture is another very interesting research area. There's a lot of research which shows that, that ex the negative externalities are due to, not due to necessities, they're coming from luxuries and much more refinements. The air conditioner is a lot of refinement, correct or not? It's coming from the, in the lower level, there is, uh, there, there is a better service to society. The negative externalities are low. When you move up, there's less service to society, the negative externalities are more. So this is also not, we, we did not address it in our research. It, it is a researchable, it's a researchable key for future research. You talk about the conference, maybe some people would be interested in. Yeah. What if we find that there are lots of processes on the lower level that actually create more pollution than the ones at the top? Then which is better? Uh, then which is better? You were talking about those. Yeah, yeah, no, right. So, so these, are the, these are the research questions. So these are the. But the current research, which which is empirical, shows this. is an empirical research which shows that the most of the emissions are coming from the private jets, for example. Yeah, they're not coming from the people who are working on the street. Good point. That's the type of question is the research are doing. So this type of research is also an original idea of doing. And uh, the basic needs, which, which are actually SDG1, SDG2, SDG3, SDG4, these are the basic needs where the pollution is very low. But uh, the pollution starts when you have cruises and other things like that. So uh, I, what I'm saying is that researchable, the current research, which is not Islamic finance research, is uh, showing that most of the pollution is coming from income inequalities. The poor people do not pollute, the rich people are polluting. The poor people don't have mm -hmm. SUVs, correct? It's very much understandable. <laughs> okay. So another thing is uh, if somebody is interested in the policy research, this is also a very good framework that uh, in Malaysia, you, your success, one of the reason of your success is this framework. The reason of the, uh, the Turkish success is also the same framework. It, you do not have a, a resource rich country. Resource rich. Uh, 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 this is RRCs, actually, resource rich country. So the implication is that uh, I, I will pick up only one or two examples. But again, from the research point of view, we're talking about to generate original new dimension of research. What is the implication of this type of thinking for central bank reserve management? Central banks have a lot of reserves, correct? What are they doing? They're investing in carbon intensive bonds or anything like that. So what is the implication is that the central bank reserve management or monetary policy or fiscal policy should be addressing these issues, which is actually very easy to do, but the culture is not there. Okay, so uh, science and technology is, of course, very helpful in this thing. And uh, there are a lot of examples in it, which are quite obvious, which I 
like the solar energy, like carbon sequestering and recycling. One of uh, my country's problem is uh, we don't have energy. The cold energy is a cheap energy, but coal is uh, dangerous. But if you can capture the carbon, the coal energy will be available, clean energy at a low rate. If the carbon can be uh, captured, it will be clean energy also. So the technology has a lot of revolutionary implications for this thing. Industrial economies. Uh, we were discussing with Dr. Dizun about this before. There's a great potential of applying this philosophy of zero waste in the Malaysian industrial economy, which is what they call industrial symbiosis, is a system of putting industries together where one industry's uh, waste is becoming an input of the, another industry. So we don't lose anything. So uh, for, for Malaysia, it's very relevant because the countries around are actually embarking on this idea. And, and, and indeed, you, you people are much ahead, value-based intermediation, and uh, this other, uh, a lot of uh, regulatory support is coming up to, to us supporting this type of ideas. And then uh, the financial services best practice, like the disclosure requirements uh, coming from uh, the IFRS Foundation and GCFD disclosures, a lot of ESG disclosures are coming up. So what are the opportunities for us, for Islamic economics, the Makassid driven Islamic economics, the VBI driven Islamic economics, this concept of zero waste and zero emission, zero river, uh, which is the idea of the circular, circular practices is much more relevant. And uh, this will lead to looking at halal minus purification of environmental and ecological impurity and halal on Taiwan be the basis of the... So, uh, of course, it has an implication one of the implications is that uh, if there is a carbon impurity, how to purify it? First of all, we don't consider it as an impurity in the Sharia, but there is a, this view has to be to, to be re, re studied, re evaluated. And if there is an impurity, what to do? Of course, probably we have to generate charity to purify that. As in the Sharia screening, there is a charity, charitable faculty to purify the impurity of the interest income. Similar in, uh, charity probably can come into this. So uh, this is another thing that uh, in each, you know, in each uh, of the financial contracts, we need to add to it sustainability features. In each financial, murabaha, sustainable murabaha. The old murabaha and sustainable murabaha are two different contracts. Mudaraba, sustainable Mudaraba. Musharaka, sustainable Mudaraba. But then we can also combine these contracts together. Uh, I, this by itself will require a very long lecture, so I don't have that. But what I'm saying is that another research area is to look at the inserting the sustainability into the financial contracts and combining the contract from the perspective of strengthening the sustainability feature. I think, uh, Doctor, I will, I will listen to you, and I will, I will conclude. Okay. Do, do you have another ten minutes? Okay. So the, I'm sure most of you people are saying that this will increase the cost of doing business. Correct. If you think differently, this will increase the cost of doing the business. So first of all, we have to think about it in a serious way. That is the sustainability, which is uh, in another name of eliminating or reducing the negative externalities, is something which is a shared responsibility. 
a shared responsibility of the different stakeholders. And I'm talking about here shared responsibility of two stakeholders. Here in the upper part, which is Professor Aslam's uh, idea, that the Islamic social finance and the commercial finance should not work together. They should work separately. Okay? This is the traditional argument. This is how it is. They don't work together. They, because the social finance is mandated to be social oriented and the commercial finance is mandated to be profit generating. So, the, so there's no commonality. So the arrows go like that. So if we put the sustainability in the middle, we want to promote sustainable SMEs in the middle. Can we divert the arrows? Is there any good reason for diverting the arrows? So what I am saying is that the banks should not only look to be as banks, commercial banks, they also, this is what the VBI actually has this idea that the banks should try to generate empowerment initiatives with the help of other stakeholders. Okay? So this is already there, it's not something uh, not there, but it's not being done by the banks. And in the same way, uh, if you are saying the AFCAF should not do it, let's say about the Bill Gates Foundation or any other philanthropic institution, they already do a lot of philanthropy. So if they can divert it to the sustainability the shared uh, idea, which is SDG 17, they call it, then they will create a lot of leverage. And it will also potentially lead to reducing the cost of doing the business because the philanthropy can subsidize, the governments cannot subsidize because the huge subsidy is required, but the philanthropies and the other charitable organizations potentially can subsidize uh, the cost of uh, financing for SMEs. If you look at the Begnagara current budget, they have introduced eight or nine different initiatives to support SMEs. Some of them are uh, something related to this type of an idea that the stakeholders can come together and the uh, sustainable SMEs can be supported in a way that their cost of financing or cost of doing the business can be somehow a little bit subsidized with some percentage subsidization is possible. So that's uh, what I'm saying is that universities, our universities, why don't you start a program like uh, sustainability management? Why to continue only with this uh, MA economics or BA economics? Why not uh, to have a BA uh, in sustainability management? For example, it's a huge departure. That type of in your curriculum also, that the one which you are doing, these issues are extremely relevant, but it's not addressed. They're not addressing these issues. They, we, if we don't address these issues, this is the picture which I showed you, it's our responsibility, whether we are teachers, professors, or whoever we are, it's our responsibility. And there is a lot of value in doing it. So this, uh, these considerations are relevant for so many other reasons also, which is there's something which we know as climate finance. Uh, professor, this is another theme in the conference. Some people should write about climate finance, Islamic climate finance. One of the, uh, there are so many ideas in the Islamic climate finance. One of the ideas is being presented by the Western country. That, uh, for example, Pakistan has to pay Four billion US dollars every year as interest uh, service payment on the previous debts. So the idea is that, okay, don't pay this four billion. You use this for sustainability project in your own country. They call it uh, uh, debt, debt reduction swap with environmental project. Yeah, yeah, the, the ones who are, they are saying that, okay, don't pay to us this 4 billion, you use it to generate sustainability capacity in your, in your economy. This is a research These are, these are the areas of research 
which we, we are not doing, we should do. So this is what I, I say here. And the other thing is that uh, the, the others, the integrated approach is much better than uh, an unintegrated approach. There's a lot of commonality uh, between uh, the original Islamic economics and finance aspiration and the ethical finance and all these things, there's a lot of commonality here. So we have to in, have an integrated approach instead of saying that, uh, the, uh, of course, our system is excellent, but this integrated approach is much more powerful. Than the, and another, another research area is environmental hisba. I think in the, in the, in the Kulia, somebody was doing research on hisba sometime. So this idea of environmental hisba is a, a very important research area which uh, we, we haven't been able to do it. This, uh, we should really, we should really do. Yeah, okay. How many people know the, the golden there? This is, the, this, is, this is called the Estolab of the 19th century Islamic world. I don't know how they were using it, they were using it to uh, have uh, study the stars in the universe. Correct? The second picture here is the first picture taken outside space of the Earth. So that second picture, I, in my understanding, has facilitated the, by the Estrolab because that's where the continuity of the human effort is coming. And the second picture is the first time realization given to humankind that your beautiful earth is a small thing out in the hostile universe. You have to do something for it. Uh, the, the green, uh, which I showed to you, the preoccupation is generated by that. And this was taken by the Apollo mission, uh, which was 19, something like uh, 1969 or something like that. First time it was taken. So, so look here, what I'm saying is that negative MPV, but very high positive net future value. The, the Apollo mission is not based on net present value. Correct or not? So you have to think about things where the future value can be really very important. Uh, not always the present value. That type of thinking is looking ahead. That type of thinking is extremely, extremely useful. We, we think like that. So finally, am I hopeful? I am very hopeful for, for so many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, Islamic norms of behavior are, they are reassured by science, scientific, studies that unless we change our behaviors in this particular pattern, we are not going to have a good impact. So uh, our values are all here. It's so beautiful, actually. It's so beautiful. We understand uh, whatever I said it, uh, in, in a number of examples, we understand it in a better way than any other community. But the problem is that we are driven by the, uh, the approach. The second thing is that the Makassid framework is really a robust framework. And the third thing is the regenerative, restorative and regenerative business models are already becoming very popular. So it's not something which, uh, which is new. It, we have passed that experimental stage. Number four, green disruptive technologies are coming in a very supportive way. And number five, value-based finance and regulation is coming up. So I am very, I am very actually uh, hopeful that we have Islamic economics and finance. If we change our approach, we have a lot to offer and we can contribute extremely positively to uh, this agenda. Okay? Thank you. But I, I mean, in, in but the ideas are mine, not in
Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Tarikullah. I think, you know, your presentation today, I mean, and you managed to go through all the 60 yeah. odd slides, although some, uh, you know, uh, and these are slides are available for the, for the audience. Yeah. So we'll make this available for those who are interested to, uh, to take uh, a closer look at all of them. Uh, Allah. This is really um, an agenda, if I can put it that way. What, what has been presented in this lecture today? Really something that, um, for, for, for those of us who were reading the works of uh, pioneers in the late 70s and early 80s, um, they were talking about many of the things, you know, the values and the norms, uh, that, that ideal that we wanted to achieve. Um, and at that point in time, for many reasons, which could also be a, a research of somebody, we did not follow through yeah? uh, for a variety of reasons. And the model that we used was the model that uh, I think is explained as the, the Tijari, uh, CRC, and Ishtima'i, the three separate and never meeting sectors of the Islamic economy, right? And banks, Tijari only, right? Um, and yet, as we see today, um, people are now talking about the fact that the Tijari sector should also be concerned about well-being of people. Right? Should be talking about, in this case, the future generations and so on. So the, the environment has changed after 40 plus years that makes it possible for us now to actually revisit some of our ideas that we had in the past, utilize the developments that have been going on in the last two decades and move Islamic economics, Islamic finance in a direction that it should have gone 20, 30, 40 years ago. Right? So it gives us an opportunity. And I think I share uh, Prof. Tarikullah's uh, optimism that now is the time actually that would enable us to present Islamic economics in a way that we did not do or could not do yeah, 30, 30, 35 years ago. Um, and maybe just as a last point before we open up for Q&A, uh, I like this idea about curriculum modification. Uh, how do we bring in elements of what has been discussed today into our curriculum? And uh, in our project, and, and I think I may have mentioned it to you, uh, the Kulia is talking about uh, Vision 2077, 16th century Hijra challenges. And, and one of the things that we envisage for Islamic economics, uh, Islamic finance, is that there is a need for education to play a role. So curriculum reform, curriculum change is needed. And certainly these ideas of, of moving away from what we understand as just economics or management to something that is in line with what has been presented today may be the way forward. Whether we call it sustainable management or sustainable economics or Islamic economics for that matter, or economics with a Y, <laughs> Yeah, these are all things that maybe we can think about. So with, with those few words, we have about half an hour or some uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Those in the room. Yeah. Those in the room. Can, can you guys hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Okay, so I come. This is uh, uh, so my UD here. And we will come to you. Okay, so. Uh, my beloved uh, Prof. Tariq, <laughs> all this while I've been commenting to myself. Just yesterday, there was a leadership course on uh, telling your sustainability. And two CEOs raised out a very important question. One of the CEO of Vessel, Dato, and the other one is the CEO of uh, Petronas. Yeah, sort of uh, in a dilemma in the sense that, you know, we have to do something on this uh, sustainability issue. But at the same time, there's no clear direction of where because the government itself has not put up any kind of framework, number one. Number two, on even a very simple, basic, like, uh, you know, the human behavior, like it's just throwing waste, you know, 
rubbish and not clearing all this. It's a, just a basic, basic behavior. So we have a big uh, gap, you know, between human behavior, societal needs, and also corporate. So in this context, how are you going to address sustainability? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rizu. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Uh, one thing I think we can do is that we force our young researchers to do it a different way. You know, my mind here, it becomes a little bit uh, shaky. You know, I, I, I think my, something has happened to me. We, we are still continuing our PhDs with the master thesis, with the criteria of efficiency of economic banks, with the ROE and uh, uh, ROA type of uh, mechanical things, correct or not? What if the ROE of a bank is very low, but the bank is just doing fantastic in terms of what I said? The, the research direction, the, the, the metric of understanding what's going on has to be different, correct? This is what we can do as professors in our area, our juniors and our peers, we discuss with them. And most of them, of course, will not try to understand <laughs> because this requires a different framework. On the other hand, there's a lot of responsibility in this for the municipalities and for the government. Uh, my children, when they come to, they used to come to Qatar, they will throw their garbage out like this. But uh, when we are with, we go to visit them in Canada, they force us to put the garbage in a proper place. The society is reflected in the, uh, in the system of the government. So here, even uh, Malaysia is much more advanced in terms of sustainability, but you don't have the separation of waste at the origin. This is a system. In the household, you separate the, the waste, there is, a, there is a combustible waste, vegetable in our BC. There is a waste which is useless, just to be thrown away. And there is a waste which is the recyclable, correct? The compostable waste is collected almost daily basis because it makes the environment bad. But the other waste is not, it's not so urgent to be collected. So that's how the governments are doing and it is municipalities are doing. This they have to do. Governments have to do it. Correct or not? I'm sorry, I, I don't have a, I don't have a quick solution for this. Yeah, I, I think Dr. something that has been a major challenge in all kinds of studies in Islamic economics and finance. We have all these great ideas and wonderful values and norms, but Put it into practice is another is another thing. And, and that is why again I, I, I go back to my earlier point. Our current environment is one that enables us to do that much easier than it was maybe 40 years ago. You have a lot of people who are in agreement with those things. Yeah. I I, I share this quite to quite a few of you. A few years ago there was a big um, what is it called? Kazana organizes this uh, uh, what is it? Mega trends, yeah, and they brought in Joseph Stiglitz, and Joseph Stiglitz was talking about something that is a paradigm shift, and we need to think of the future generations, and we need to think of the environment, and everybody in the hall was saying, "Wow, wow, what a great idea!" And I was thinking, we've been talking about this for forty years, you know, and yet it takes Joseph Stiglitz to come, and everybody has this wow. So it's it's also the inability of maybe. Um, you know, Islamic economies, and even those from the developing world, you know, to, to have a say, that's the other, the other issue, right? You, you, you need to be having the right people say the things, right? Or else people don't listen. So we can do partnerships. All right, there was somebody from uh, Prof. Let me try to answer. Uh, I will first and then we'll <laughs> Please. Because one is we are talking about program in sustainability. So we already have program in sustainability in the university, which is master in the sustainability and PhD sustainability. It's just that it's not under it's not under this school. Yeah. 
under the Sejahtera Center, but it's collaboration between uh, different things. Yeah. So, because if you are talking about sustainability, it is something that is uh, interrelated. So that's why it is under different tools. Yeah. So if let's say we have someone who wants to study about uh, water, yeah, then you can have uh, that the person go to the different uh, different tool. Yeah. Okay. So so a few things that I think uh, very important if you want to talk about the contributions of the tool. Yeah. So currently the tool is working with the UNDP and Ministry of Finance and then uh, the Ministry of Economy with regard to sustainability. We are doing the integrated financing framework for, for Malaysia. So uh, in the in integrated financing framework, there are mentions of uh, you know, uh, you are talking about Islamic finance. How can Islamic finance uh, contribute? It's just that when, when we look at the literature, so we, we have to most of it come from the uh, conventional so how do we translate it to how do we translate to Islamic economy so that is the integrated financing framework for uh, for Malaysia I think, I think a lot of countries in the world have this integrated financing framework and we are also working with uh, the Ministry of Economy and coming up with the uh, the roadmap for SDG for Malaysia uh, so in the roadmap so what, uh, because you, you have shown that uh, we need uh, uh, up and the ESG and SDG, and that, uh, that you have the, the the important of the importance of value. That is what we wrote in the. That's what we wrote in the report. What is missing in SDG is the value. So we have to. We need to. We need to have that value to envelope the envelope the SDG. So that's what. Uh, that's what <coughs> I wrote in the. I wrote in the report. Okay, and when we give training to the uh, to the ministries of economy personnel, so that's the that's the one thing that we that we emphasize. So the main thing is the value. If you know, if you love your planet, the, the one thing that you are going to do is you are going to you are going to save, you are going to preserve uh, the you are going to preserve the planet. So uh, it, uh, we try the, the one thing that uh, that we try to do is. Uh, how do we how do we put the Islamic element without putting the the Islamic word? So if you put Islamic word, then they are going to reject the document. So so that's what uh, instead of putting the word makasi, then we are we are putting the word value and you know, uh, something that is uh, something that's related to that. So when when I look at your your model that you put in the WhatsApp. So I, oh, so we have we have it already in the uh, in the roadmap for in the roadmap for Malaysia. So, so. Prof, can I ask a question? Okay, hey, the person on the uh, Zoom, uh, uh, just. I can I ask a question, Prof? Please. Yes, my question is oh, uh, thank you, please. Professor Tarikula, for wonderful uh, discussion. But uh, um, uh, you're talking um, from the can environmental you, point of view. Can you please uh, introduce yourself? Can I raise a question, sir? Can you raise? Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Dr. M. Ashraf Al Haq from University Uttara Malaysia. Okay, right. Yes, my question is: uh, This is very important, as Professor Tarikullah has mentioned about uh, environmental concerns. But as we know, in the current climax, uh, this um, 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 beyond sustainability, politics is also an issue social factors also an issue. So those factors also has to be come into the picture in addition to anthropogenic or this environmental concerns. Thank you. Okay, so if I understand correctly, uh, doing this is going to require uh, not only academics, but it has social impacts, it has political uh, impacts. So how do we, how do we tackle that? Again, uh, I don't have any quick fix. I'm sorry for that. But uh, the thing is that what I said and it is in the presentation, that this is something which at each stage it is relevant. Whether it is the central bank monetary policy, or whether it is the fiscal policy, whether it is the municipalities policy, whether it is the ministry's policy, 
or whatever, it, because everybody is breathing air, correct or not? It's relevant for everyone. So the, this is uh, our, our friends here are mentioning this lot of things going on, but from from the academics, the problem is that we are in the comfort zone because this is something new. I I don't have to teach them microeconomics, but in this context. And I don't have to teach the monetary economics, but in this context. I don't have to teach the Islamic financial contracts, but in this context. So the, the comfort zone is the major thing here. Uh, so, of course, it's a complex thing, and we're not going to solve it in 10 years or 15 years. I, the picture is there, 2,100. So when my grandson is going to be 70 years, can we have the temperatures less than four degrees or two degrees or something? It's something very complex and very much ongoing. Thank you. I know, I think whether or not it is something that we are able to do and do effectively, we still have to do it. I think that's the lesson that this new economic agent that is being proposed uh, at least actually being proposed 40 years ago, or maybe even 50 years ago, whether we are successful or not, it's what we need to do. And, and I think that's, that's what the agent in Islamic economics is, is needed to do, right? If we do it well and we do it effectively, alhamdulillah, that's, that's great. But even if we are not successful, that's what we need to do. And that's not going to change. Okay, um, questions? Next, any other? Yes, Adam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi uh, uh, In the mainstream economics, uh, the internalization of uh, externality, both uh, positive and, ex uh, and negative, uh, subsidy regulation and social responsibility. Uh, Prof, could you elaborate uh, more on how Islamic economics differs from conventional economics in this respect? Thank you. Yes, I will, but uh, Professor Asan will not agree. That's the problem. We, we, never, we never know. We never... <laughs> subsidy, the idea of the subsidy is that it's coming from the government always, correct? We have to change that notion. What I am saying is social subsidy. Instead of the government, uh, creating the subsidy, the subsidy can be created by the social institutions like the philanthropies. The philanthropies are only subsidizing a lot of things, but coming in a purpose-driven environment, uh, this, in my example, it was sustainable or green SME financing, and there's an issue of subsidizing the cost. This, if, if it is a shared responsibility, of the various stakeholders, not only the banks, also the philanthropies, also the impact investors, also the donors, also the government, also the central bank, then the social subsidy can be created. Without creating subsidy and the governments, uh, my government, uh, for example, Pakistani government is already under serious burden. I, I, I'm not expecting them to create further subsidy and borrow from the World Bank or something like that. But the Afghan institutions and other philanthropic institutions, they can do better if they think in terms of creating social subsidy instead of fully financing something. I mean, I also like this idea, uh, you know, firstly, anthropogenic. Um, you know, it's all about the fact that human beings are now the biggest impactor on, on the universe. Right? So previously it used to be natural disasters, but now it's human beings. So if we look at it from one way, so far it's been pretty bad. We've not done a good job. Right? So I think what is being proposed is that we may still be in the anthropogenic era, but now we are trying to make the positive externalities become more than the negative. As you are. So to, to actually try to get the regenerative um, what you call it, uh, capacity uh, rather than the degenerative which it is now. 
and I think in your in your diagram, sustainable is right in the middle. Right? So we are trying to go sustainable, but ultimately we would like to go to the regenerative side, which is maybe way ahead if possible. All right, we still have time. So any other Ambreen? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for such an uh, insightful uh, lecture and uh, enlightening us on this topic. I want to talk about a paradox uh, that when their uh, technology progresses, uh, it uh, reduces the cost of uh, things. And so the demand for uh, products or services in, uh, increases. So instead of re reducing the resource use, we, uh, it ends up uh, increasing the resource use. In this case, how the circular economy or Islamic uh, finance or economics can help us to come out of this paradox? So when uh, the technology progresses, so the cost of uh, production of, for example, um, vehicles like uh, um, or any other um, appliances maybe, um, reduces and people demand more of those things to make the life comfortable of course so as a result the resource use uh, increases in energy or like uh, consumption so this is a kind of a paradox so uh, like we are not uh, regenerative capacity is low but uh, resource use increases so in that case it's a paradoxical thing how can we come out of this yeah i think i'm really right about that uh, this is the reason why we have the, 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 this disaster because uh, when the technology improves, the cost of the, the production reduces and then the mass production takes place. Um, I mean, the issue here is that that paradox is related to the non-renewable resources when we are able to extract a lot of natural resources by drilling and the drilling technology has become very efficient. We can drill maybe uh, uh, 1000 feet down or 1000 meter down, but still that uh, resource is what we call as uh, uh, non-renewable, is exhaustible resource. And this is what economics is always thinking about. The exhaustible resources, and in, in the uh, there is uh, what is it called uh, Fortiling, the Fortiling paper, the very famous paper, which is the basis of the whole thing, is uh, economics of exhaustible resources. And in his in his model, society will always be in a better shape if the natural resources are converted into the man-man resources and put into the bank as a bank account. And that creates the type of discounting uh, paradox which I was mentioning. But on the other hand, if the technology improves in the renewable energy, renewable resources, then that's what actually is the, the thing, the regenerative thing. It will regenerate because this is renewable. There's no limit to solar power, correct or not? The only externality in there is that probably the batteries will create a problem, which in my diagram, I, I, I have put them in one of the quadrants, uh, but uh, that, that issue has to be challenged. Other than that, it only reduces the cost and which is the regenerative nature of it. Okay, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's definitely this uh, query by Amrit. It's something that has to be, I think, thought about further because sometimes uh, you know, trying to create a better life for the 8 billion population means increasing their quality of life. And that would also have impact on how much resources we're using. I mean, we're actually going to have to see how that affects total um, you know, uh, use of resources and how that will have to impact uh, the environment as well. Okay, we still have about five. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Omar. Doing, currently doing my PhD in this kuliah, economics, in Islamic economics and uh, economics. Uh, first of all, thank you to you, Corp, for coming to our university. I think I have met you several times before, including in Usif. 
and uh, to actually environment is not really my interest but i think it's very important to be discussed what more during the climate climate change nowadays so that's why i'm coming here and uh, i would like to ask you one question uh, you have experience living in middle east and also you also have taught several courses if i'm not mistaken in the middle east universities right so many of the muslim countries they are endowed with uh, non-renewable resource which mainly petroleum and it becomes their main source of economic uh, growth and also economic uh, portion of the economic structure, including Malaysia, and I think one more in the Middle East. And right now, some of them seems that do not want to react too much in order to support the sustainable, especially trying to reduce the portion of making products out of the petroleum, because the petroleum is a non renewable and causes to some of the uh, environmental destruction in some like the cases and something like that. So what do you, how do you respond to that? I mean, do they, are, are they actually willing to move from uh, non-renewable based kind of economics towards renewable based of economics like we have in uh, manufacturing of electric car or whatsoever? I mean, uh, what's your spirit and comments on that? Thank you. Yes, of course, that is a big challenge. And if you look at the, the 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 GCC countries, actually, in in my second slide, do you remember the second slide was about uh, the transformation? Uh, there was uh, it was written there GCC countries. But I deleted it because I don't want to, I don't want to be politically incorrect. Okay, the GCC countries are at the same level as the developed countries with respect to their HDI and ecological footprint. And each of the country, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, these countries have their own now national green transformation policies, visions, and they are aware about it, that their, their economy has to be diversified. You didn't mention another seri serious issue, which is the, because of the green technology revolution, the old technologies, which are fossil fuel technologies, are going to be stranded assets. It's a very serious risk for them. For the economy. So they are aware, aware about it, but of course, this is a big resource for them, isn't it? They already have a lot of foreign exchange reserves. That's what I was mentioning, the central bank reserve management. If they can redirect those reserves into greener technologies, for example, in the Middle East, uh, probably the solar technology, the green technology, and the hydro, hydrogen technology, this, they are investing a lot of money into it. Of course, this is their necessity. Otherwise, maybe their economies are not sustainable. You mentioned this. I, I remember in the conference in Qatar, there was a paper about uh, the GCC countries and how inefficient they were in terms of the energy, their carbon footprint, right? So, so but, but realization is there, right? So it's starting. The question from uh, Noor Kamaria is that what about if we think about consumption? At the end of the day, if you reduce your demand, then so is that a possibility? Is that something that you would propose that you're able to control the demand side? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the food waste, the, the previous question, the food waste in the GCC countries is 104 kg. Per person. Per person. Yeah. For population about 60 million in the GCC countries, you multiply it by 100 and uh, something, it becomes into millions of tons food waste. And of course, uh, we have this uh, on the other hand. And the wasatia and all those good things 
so that is the issue. Uh, how much of our personal consumptions we can reduce? So that if in that context, this issue of externalities is relevant for each one of us also, correct? If we are consuming more, then what we need to do, there is an externality. So it has to be controlled. And and of course our tradition has it. Again, it's about translating those ideas into practice, which which is a major, major challenge. Okay. Um, is there another question? Okay, who is it by? Just go up. Uh, Shabil. Since we knew that sustainable and green energy goods are much more affordable compared to previous era, in your opinion, what is the best way we can invest more in the green economy uh, development where more and more innovation could be realized to create new green economic cycle? Or should we start a new green Islamic economic system from zero? Okay, so now we have Islamic economics, but we have green Islamic economics. So <laughs> either start from zero or we can actually use what we have today and make some, you know. So I request Dr. Professor Aslam to answer this. <laughs> One of the things what uh, EFT is trying to do is to internalize the externalities, okay? trying to price the externalities. Okay? And currently we have some uh, talking about true price. So if let's say uh, the government can come up with a system where all the externalities can be internalized, where every, all the, the pollutions can be priced, will it solve the issues that we have currently? Should we say it is uh, a, a sustainable Islamic finance or green Islamic economy? If you are asking my opinion, I would say no. Because essentially, Islamic economics is by its nature is green. So we don't need to add another, another qualifier to it. And Islamic finance is in the same way is essentially sustainable. We don't need to add words to it, but what we need to do is to change the practice. And can we change the practice without changing the names? This is, this is a major problem. Can we change the teaching of microeconomics without referring to the zero waste uh, uh, businesses? That's the problem, okay? So, so so probably we we need to give up the microeconomics totally and start another type of economics which is underlying uh, that economics are these issues. What is the behavior of the farm in the context of what I was mentioning is that the economics is the study of the behavior of an individual and which has led to this situation. So. If we put green, what will happen? Nothing will happen to it. But we have to change the practices. So that can be the question is that can we do that without changing the net? How effective it will be? See, this is what the, your conference is now is in the same dilemma that we don't want to put so many new words into it, it's already there. But the practice is not actually coming to the reality. So at least at the level of the research, we have to have to uh, discuss uh, these different concepts. Like for example, uh, green economic, Islamic economics, Islamic economics, green Islamic economics, sustainable Islamic economics. What is the difference? Why are these relevant? Could be why not? Conceptually, they are good to do to understand it like that. Well, Kamaria gives the answer. Islam is a green deal. So by default, if we follow Islamic approach, it is green. So we don't need to have green in front of Islamic. That's what I understand. 
but as mentioned it's not easy because unfortunately the current uh, the current position taken and the current dominant position is sometimes not uh, where we want to go uh, how we move to the direction we want to go that's that's the challenge uh, do we start from zero I, i'm not a i'm not a i'm not in favor of starting from zero i don't think there is any reason why we need to start from zero it's about how we utilize what we have and how to improve uh, and having the right uh, maybe strategies and priorities in doing that. I think that, that to me is a preferable way. It's the way of the Quran, it's the way of the Prophet, it's the way of Islamic civilization. So it should be our way, not, not to dump everything out for the last two hours. Um, all right, I think we've come to the. Ah, yes, okay, this may probably be the last uh, question. This is uh, just for your information. Uh, Prof. Tarikula is in the IAIE Council. He's the immediate past president of the council. So he's been there together with the discussions of all co conferences uh, and also will be highly involved in the 15th as well. Although, although he may not want to be there in the forefront, but he will definitely be consulted um, because one, he's also in KL, right? So we're going to get him easily to come and give input. So please, what can we do uh, specifically in the conference so that we can you know, realize some of these things that we've been talking about? Of course, for the conference, the main thing is the Kalpa paper, which is already, which is already gone out. But another thing which can be done is to especially request some young people to write papers on some topics which are closer to the team, like what the managed policy can do to enhance sustainability in a country. For example, this is a new topic and it's very relevant. And in the same way, what the, the fiscal policy can do a lot of discussion of fiscal policy is already done correctly. Uh, but uh, what fiscal policy can do to enhance sustainability is a new thing, which is very much relevant in people writing about it in Islamic economics, we are not doing it, which is, uh, uh, for example, that type of, if you ask, uh, uh, for example, if he's uh, doing this PhD, if you, you ask him to write something about uh, and another person and another person and Amreen is doing PhD, you should ask her to to write. Uh, she has a very good point actually with uh, the technology side of it. Uh, it's a good point which can be developed into a paper related to the team. So special effort if you do, it will generate some, some papers at least. Okay, so basically uh, the 40 in this room, you're invited to write papers for the conference and also the 47 or how many that were on Zoom, you're also invited to write papers to the conference. Sorry? Well, you write the paper and then we have to see whether the paper gets presented. Yeah, uh, I'm sure we will be happy to accept papers if they are good quality and if we need to increase the number of days alhamdulillah but so far two days three days have been sufficient okay so uh professor Prof, i have uh, a question the last yeah although yeah okay please the last. assalamu alaikum i'm hanisa hassan reading um, self law in islamic banking finance uh, harun hashim law center um um 
congratulations for the very insightful and profound sharing, Professor Tahikula. And I, and this, this talk remind me to the commentaries made by, by Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim while he presenting budget, annual budget that I could, uh, despite the grand achievement, the Islamic finance sector has still not reached its full potential based on values to fulfill contemporary economic and social needs. Today's Islamic finance ecosystem has yet to match the idealism of Islamic finance vanguard, such as Professor Dr. Muhammad Najibullah Sadiqi, who emphasized the concept of justice and morality in accordance to Maqasad al-Sharia. He, for example, said more than anything else, Islamic bank and finance, the subculture of Islamic economics has been a quest for justice and morality into the ordinary business of life. So, uh, mashallah, it's very fruitful sharing for us as a cream of society to, yeah, to, to regain our consciousness and do boost our motivations to do more in, 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 in research. And, uh, and my question is how to... Uh, build a cooperation between the legal, legal fraternity and also from the economic uh, people here and then also the, for the banking, uh, those who are in the banking sector because um, for, uh, as we learn, banking is confined and defined. We, um, bank, bank is just uh, functions as financial intermediary. So there must be a policy to be governed and uh, to be, uh, yeah, and, and it must be uh, corporations. Yeah, so my question is um, how to mold such uh, a good cooperative uh, uh, works together between the sectors in, in, in achieving. How do we get the Islamic bankers to listen to the economists? I am a sister, sister in the, in the legal profession. Are you in the legal profession? One, 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 one practical cooperation is extremely needed in my view is related to the restructuring of the financial sector. Uh, I, I mentioned about the comparison between a Tawaruf contract, which is structured, designed to finance a sustainable SME, and another contract which is not addressing the sustainability issue. Which one is better? The one which is addressing the sustainability issue is the better, better one. So that means that we have to restructure the country. We have to restructure all the contracts to incorporate in them sustainability issues. So this is the level of cooperation because the structuring is a legal issue and uh, cooperation with economists, but the economists will not understand this. I'm very sorry about that. That's the problem. They will say that this is uh, doesn't make sense because they are having a paradigm which is filled with uh, those old ideas. I, do, you, do you agree with that? I personally don't agree, but uh, <laughs> there are some economists like that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You know, I, your question also raises to, raises in my, you know, what I remember in the early days of Islamic banks. There were also cases where many people were unhappy that Islamic banks were more exploitative than conventional banks. And it was very sensitive because you would take a housing financing facility from Islamic bank and you would have to pay much more than borrowing money from a conventional bank. Right? So your question about uh, Mudaraba Musharaka can also be applied to conventional banks and Islamic banks. Right? So the idea is how do you make sure that all parties in the in that transaction get a fair deal? I think that that's that's what it's all about. Okay, there is a question, but I think maybe this I was just going to ask him to contact Prof. Tarikula about the halal you know, concept, your views on halal. So in Indonesia, apparently they're coming up with um, you know, a new indicator um, that uh, looks at three dimensions of halal, halal in product, halal in source, halal, halal in source of finance, and halal in business process. So wanting your 
inputs on this. Maybe just a few. I, I, I will invite to comment on that because I'm not a career scholar. So uh, please I, forgive me uh, in this uh, discussion of halal, what type of things is going on. It's very difficult for me. To, I, I would just maybe uh, ask, you know, the brother or sister, I'm not sure who is the one who's asking, but maybe you can contact, uh, you know, oh, I see, brother Ali Sakti, who was with us, uh, I think now he's with Bank Indonesia. Um, so um, uh, please contact Prof. Tarikula, I think you're no uh, stranger to, to all of us. So, so with that, I think we've come to the end of the session. Uh, we've had, a, I think, a very interesting presentation and discussion on, on the various issues raised. Uh, once again, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Prof. Tarikullah for, for agreeing to come and, you know, and share with us his ideas. As I said, it's really an agenda that he's presenting, something that we may all think about, um, you know, how we are going to translate the, 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 the teachings that we have um, and put it into practice to make not only uh, a better system for, for Muslims and Muslim countries, but for humanity. I think this is, this is what Islamic economics, right from the beginning, was, was putting forward. It was a solution for, for man as a whole. Um, so this is the challenge, I think, that, uh, that Prof. Tarikullah is, uh, is presenting to all of us uh, in this uh, you know, view of um, thinking of the environment, talking about climate change and making it part and parcel of what we want to develop. So with that, uh, once again, thank you, Prof. Tarikullah, and uh, I hand it back to the moderator. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Dr. Tarikullah and also to Professor Dr. Aslam Hanif. Let us give a round of applause to our both our discussions today. A very wonderful, insightful uh, discussion between both of them. And I would like to thank every one of you uh, in Ibn Taymiyyah conference room and also in the Zoom meeting because all of you are so participative, uh, asking questions and also asking responses from us. And what I could wrap up from this discussion is that it is about perspective. Because uh, long ago, until now, we only look upon externalities from the conventional economics uh, perspective. Uh, the Western perspective, the Keynesian model, and so on. But now we see a brighter future, uh, like at the end of the tunnel, which is the Islamic economics perspective that is brought upon by Professor Dr. Tarikullah. Now we learn something new, and please uh, act upon it, write some papers, and we'll see each other again in ICIEF 2023 conference later. Now, on behalf of the Kulia and also IIUM, uh, we are honored to give the token of appreciation to Professor Dr. Tariq Khan. I would like to welcome our Dean, Professor Dr. Garu Zazmi, to present the token of appreciation to Professor Dr. Tariq All right, once again, a round of applause to our professor. Thank you very much. All right, with the end of our sessions, here comes the end of our insightful discourse. May Allah bless our Professor Dr. Tarikullah for his willingness to come to KNMS and give us a piece of his masterpiece, his mind. Now, we'll move on to the photography session. Our committee will assist you. Uh, so, all participants, uh, in the Zoom meeting, don't leave yet, just yet. You will be included in the photography session as well. In Ibn Taymiyyah conference room, you may stand up and gather at the center of our conference room. We will be having the photography session. Tafadol. Brothers, sisters, you may stand up now. Go to the center of the uh, conference room.
or we still have uh, some 20% or 10% or is it in Zoom meeting? 22%. Uh, all the attendees in the Zoom meeting, academicians, professors, lecturers, students, uh, please open up your camera if you could. I could see Mr. Yusuf Ismail is opening up uh, his camera already. Uh, Salam alaikum, sir. Uh, all right. The others, we really hope that you could open up your camera if you could. So we will take the pictures of the brothers first. Okay, I'll count to three, okay? So one, two, three. Okay, again, one, two, three. Uh, freestyle, any style you want to put? Peace, so on. Okay, ready? One, two, three. All right. So next, uh, sisters. Oh, not yet. Uh, wait, wait, brothers, brothers, uh, not yet, brothers. There's one more picture that we want to take with you, brothers, uh, with the poster behind it. All right. Okay. All right, one more picture. Okay, ready? Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Now, I would like to welcome sisters, our participants, our sisters in the Ibn Taymiyyah conference room to take the picture. Our uh, committees, you can ask them to uh, take the picture. All right. Uh, for brothers, for participants who already taken the picture, please don't leave yet. Uh, we have provided refreshments for you. So before you leave, take those refreshments. Thank you. Yeah, yes, over there. Okay. All sisters, all sisters are included. Okay, ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. Freestyle. One, two, three. Okay, very good. Okay, please, please, there's one more, one more. The prof, there's one more. The organizing committee, please go back. The boys and girls, please oh. go back, Organize, including yourself, MC. Okay. Go there, take the photo. MC and the organizing committee, Aliani, where are you? Aliani and others, Nazif, you are doing a good job. Yes, organizing committee, please stay there.
All right, um, we are done with the photography session. To our participants in the conference room, before you leave, uh, please take some refreshments provided by the organizer uh, at the side of our conference room. Uh, with that, I am Shamshul Haris, your MC for today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.